And uh, we're going to finish up our series on David. And, uh, you know, David's story is kind of a book ended with, with a high point and a low point. And, and the high point really began with this character named Goliath, because when David slew Goliath with a sling and a stone, that really marked his rise in popularity, that people really saw this man as a leader, as a boy that had great faith, and God called him to be the future king of Israel. But we're going to come across another character, which I think marks the decline of David's kingdom. And that's a, a lady named Bathsheba. Well, we're going to look at today's David's encounter with Bathsheba and what he did. And, and when he was young, you could see his bold faith. And in this incident today, we're going to see bold rebellion in what he does. You know, one of the things that, that always amazes me is how Christian leaders can fall so hard. It seems like every so often I open up the, my, my email box and here's another pastor, another popular speaker, a Christian writer who's fallen. You know, some of these secrets have come out and, and there's been sexual scandal, there's been financial misdealings, there's been um, character weaknesses, temper tantrums, all sorts of things that have happened and it's finally been brought out in the public. And one of the things that I've noticed is that pretty common with all of those is denial and the failure to really own their sins. We're going to see something different in how David deals with his today. But the thing that's common with David and all of them is that they're all, they all know better. This isn't like new believers stumbling in sin. These are mature believers. And I think all of us who've been walking with the Lord, uh, there's a number of us in this room who've been walking with the Lord for decades. I want you to really pay attention because I think God has a message for us today. It's often when we're in a place of spiritual growth that we let our guard down. And that's what happens with David in this story. Now, one of the things I love about the scriptures is it doesn't hide the flaws of people. If you really wanted to sell Christianity, you'd make all the characters look better than the Bible makes them look because David doesn't look very good in this story. And David's flaws are going to be exposed big time. And yet the Bible isn't a story of perfect people. It's a story of imperfect people who've, who've encountered God's grace. And we, we recognize the fact that sin is an issue we deal with constantly. As long as we're in this body, we're going to deal with sin. And so in the book of Hebrews, it says this, Take care, brothers, and I would say sisters too, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called, it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Catch that last phrase, the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is tricky. Sin is conniving. It's almost like sin is being personified here as a person, and, and rightly so because the person that's often connected with sin is Satan. So you could tie those two together. We encounter them every day. And, and, and I know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I know that he died to forgive us. I know that he died to remove the penalty and the eternal consequences of our sins. But although Jesus conquered sin, we must contend with sin. Every single day of our lives, as long as we're in this body on this earth, you will fight sin. Now, God's given us resources. We have the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the church community to help us. But even then, it is still a battle all through our lives. And it's like things change over time. The tactics, the strategies of the enemy change over time, but sin continues to be a battle. And so what I want us to, to, to see in the story of David is how sin can be so deceitful and how we can be taken captive by the lies that we believe about sin. And maybe you've been caught in one of these lies. Maybe you're living a lie right now and failing to see what God sees. So let's begin our story. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll actually be in, in a couple chapters, um, chapters 11 and 12. It says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. And David remained at Jerusalem. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and she said, or, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness and then she returned to her house. You know, I think uh, one of the, the first lies that we experience is what David, I think, was experiencing is that sin is no longer an issue for me. 
It used to be when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when I was young and stupid, sin was a big issue for me. But I'm mature now. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. It's really not an issue for me. Maybe for you, but it's not for me. And David's at this pinnacle of his life. He's now settled in Jerusalem. The ark has been returned. He's at peace with all the enemies around him. The city's been built up. There's, he's, he's got plans to, for, for someone to build a temple for the ark. I mean, everything seems to be in place. And that's precisely the moment when sin often comes at us. Just when you feel like everything is settled. And the more we dive into this story, you're going to see that the writer of the story actually is crafting it in a particular way. It's, it, he's not just telling a story. He's telling it in a way to make several points. For example, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. What's wrong with that picture? If the kings are all going off to war, what in the world is David doing sitting at home on his couch? That's not like David. David was a warrior. He was the one who inspired the troops. David out there, this is typical of kingdoms. The kings would actually go out there on horseback and fight with their soldiers. It was inspiring to see. Now we just have a, have a, a person in an oval office, pushes a button or makes a phone call. But back then, they actually went out there, risked their lives with their men. But for some reason, David said, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to sit this one out. And he's kind of bored. There's no ESPN, no Doritos, you know. You know, there's, he's bored. And maybe he's just taking a nap. He gets up and he starts wandering around. Now, he's got this nice cedar home. It's probably bigger than any other home. He's, he sits up high. Of course, the king has to have the tallest building. He looks out over the city, probably a little bit of ego saying, look at this, this place I helped build. You know, Israel's never had a city like this. And because of me and, and my leadership, we now have Jerusalem in this place. So he's looking out and he sees this woman down there and she's taking a bath. And he goes, whoa, whoa, wow. She's something else. And it says, it happened. It happened. I can't believe it that so often people will, will fall into the trap of sin and go, I don't know, it just happened. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. The affair just happened? Like you saw this woman at work and boom, next thing you know, you're, you're naked in bed. What? How did it just happen? No, it didn't just happen. There were deliberate steps that enabled it to happen or made it more easier to happen. And, then, and none of those steps by himself, themselves were sins. I just talked to that gal. We just had coffee. We just went out for dinner. I just, I just visited her at the hotel. I mean, none of those by itself are a sin. But everyone was a compromise, making sin a little easier. You know, some, someone doesn't um, become addicted to drugs or alcohol in one moment. It's a series of choices made along the way. Someone doesn't become obese simply by walking by a buffet and go, poof, it just happened. I don't know, it just happened. No, no, I got this stash of little Debbies there in my cupboard and, and you know, drink Coke all day long and, you know, I make choices all these things along the way, it didn't just happen. David's actually orchestrating things. And you can tell it by a word the writer inserts many times, the word sent. Sent is a control word. I'm in charge, I'm making this happen. So here's what he does. He sends Joab and his men into battle. He sends messengers to find out who this woman was. He sends someone then to bring her back to him. David's making things happen. Why? Because he's king. He's king. And I don't believe for a second that Bathsheba is down there trying to seduce David. There's no indication at all that she's a temptress. No, no indication that she's looking up at him and, and flashing something, you know, David, look at me. You know, I know David's handsome. Probably looks like, you know, Brad Pitt or Jason Momoa or something. You know, he looks handsome. I mean, he's, he's well-known. He's well-admired. I mean, yeah, anybody probably say, like, oh, that'd make a great husband. But that's not what she's thinking. In fact, all we know about Bathsheba is she's taking a bath because of her uncleanness. It's a, it's a religious bath. She's doing it, excuse me, because of God's law. So the bigger question is not what Bathsheba's thinking, but what is David thinking? What's going on in David's mind? Is David thinking like, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. If I want something, I get it. I've earned it. I'm, I'm at the top, of the top of the food chain. I mean, that's what, that's what kings do, right? He, he may justify, you know, I, God gave me this strong sexual desire and he knows I have needs. Or he may just say, you know, 
I think Bathsheba's kind of lonely right now. Her husband's off at war, deployed. I just want to comfort her. I just want to take care of the woman. You know, David could be rationalizing in a lot of different ways. Do you know what Paul says when, to Timothy in regards to temptation? One little word. Flee. Flee. Get out of there as fast as you can. Don't dabble with it. Don't debate it. Don't reason with it. Don't argue. Don't try to justify your, your gradual steps. Get out of there as quick as you can because it's pulling you in little by little. And every step you take, your resolve weakens. So they come back to David. David says, go find out who this woman is. And they come back and say, well, she's the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah. Now, if you go further in um, 2 Samuel chapter 23, you'll find Uriah was one of David's mighty men. David had a corps of elite soldiers who, who did some incredible exploits. And so he's, he's telling, they're, they're telling David, David, this is, this is one of your great soldiers' wives. It's probably why they were, she was stationed or, or Uriah's house is right next to David's. She was the daughter of Eliam. Eliam is also on that list of mighty men. So not only is the husband, but the father are both two of your loyal soldiers, David. And by the way, Eliam is a son of a guy named Ahithophel, which is David's chief advisor. David, these are people from your inner circle. Bash, you know, they're not going to tell him no. They're just going to say, do you know who this is? Implying, you don't mess with this woman, Okay. This is the wrong woman to mess with. David said, bring her to me. Bring her to me. She didn't come up for dinner. Didn't come up for a chat. Came up for one reason alone, that he could lay with her. And then he sent her away. You know, some people would argue like, well, why didn't Bathsheba resist? Why didn't she say no? You know, we've had a lot of stories come out in the press in recent years of the Me Too of, of women who said, you know, I was in a position with a powerful man and I didn't know what to do. Well, if that's true of today of, say, like a, a person in, in power in business, think of the kings of those days who would actually kill you, had the power to kill you if you didn't obey their demands. What could she do? Do I want Uriah to come home and find a dead spouse? No. So she complied and did. What David asked. Now, we know that David had a strong sex drive. After he set up his headquarters in Jerusalem, one of the first things it says in Scripture is he took to himself a number of wives and concubines. Now, we know what wives are, but what are concubines? This is kind of a prickly subject, but <laughs> concubines were like, were like second wives. It, it, a lot of times in the ancient Near East, a king would have a concubine, which would be a little lesser than your wife, but someone who would function like a wife. She would bear children because having lots of children was a good thing, um, and also to meet your sexual desires. And so oftentimes they would have a concubine. But what David done is he's taken over the top. He, did, he not only has a wife and a concubine, he has multiple wives and multiple concubines, many, many, many. Plenty of women. Why is he going after Bathsheba? You know, God had warned the kings of abusing this power. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, this is one of, the, one of the cautions of a king. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. David is already making decisions that is causing him to stray from God. And you know what's so amazing to me? This is so remarkable. David's been writing psalms. David's been leading worship. David's been demonstrating such heroic faith. How could David get in this place where he's compromising so much? You know, we should know better by that place in our lives. If you've been walking with the Lord for years, you kind of know better. It's not like you just got, uh, you, you fell into the trap of sin and got caught off guard. I mean, so, sometimes it happens when we're younger. But at this stage of lives, I would just say for myself, when you sin, it definitely is a deliberate choice. We know what we're doing. David knew exactly what he was doing. I think that makes it worse. David, you know better. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? At this stage of his life, the consequences will be greater. See, when you're, when you're young, the fallout may be minimal. But when you've spent your life instructing other people of the dangers of sin, when you've taught your children, when you've taught your congregation all these things, and then you do it, 
There have been people who've left churches never to return because a pastor fell. And they say, well, you know, you, you inspired us, you led us, you showed us the way. And if, if God could let that happen to you, I'm not going to go this path. The consequences are greater. And I would say one of the issues that those of us who've been with the Lord longer deal with more than any, any other time of our lives is pride. Pride. I mean, think of all the times you hear. It's happened locally. It's happened even to our church where someone's committed, someone in leadership committed a great sin. How hard it is for that person to confess it, to fully own it. It's like it never happens. They justify it. They minimize it. That's not true. I was taking medication. I wasn't myself. You know, all kinds of excuses for why it happened. It, it's pride. I think pride is the most stubborn of all sins. And, and I've watched older believers probably don't struggle with pornography and drug addiction and, and greed. But, oh, pride. Yeah. I've seen them struggle with pride. I've struggled with pride. Do you struggle with pride? For those of you shaking your head no, you're shaking your head no? Guess why? <laughs> okay, you answered the question. Because of pride. Yes. Pride says, not me. I'm not proud. Yeah, right. It gets you in a lot of trouble. So here's what happened. David thought this will blow by. Nobody will ever know it. But here's the word. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Again, David's in charge. Go get him. Go get him. Bring him here. I'm going I'm to fix this thing. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, how the people were doing, and how the war was going. Yeah, yeah, David, you really care. You got one thing on your mind, how to, how to deal with this. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him with a present from the king. And Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. And when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. David is encountering a man who has greater character than himself. Joab will not do what his men don't get to do. You know, David wants to forget that one night stand and eliminating the pregnancy is not an option. So he makes a commitment to cover it up. And since Uriah is not cooperating, he's got plan B. Plan B. David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next and David invited him and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. Who made him drunk? Well, David did. Have another one. Have another one. Have another one. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but did not go down to his house. Even with the influence of alcohol, this man has such character, he will not go down to lay with his wife because his other men do not get to do this thing. So what's David going to do? He's got, he's got another plan, a more devious and dark plan. See, David believes this lie about sin, that you can cover it up. Sin can be covered up. I think one of the reasons we sin is because we know how we can cover it up. I'll just delete the text. I'll, I'll, I'll erase my browsing history. I'll make up a story to say where I've been. I'll get others to cover for me. And we have all kinds of ways to cover the sins in our lives. I'll point my finger and blame them. It was their fault. It was Bathsheba's fault. She's the one that, that came on to me. I, I couldn't hardly fight her off. I mean, show me the tape that proves otherwise. You know, I was at a, when I was at a um, church in Arizona, I was leading a children's ministry, and there was a, I got a phone call on a Friday from this guy. He's a firefighter, great, great man, a great young couple, had two little boys in our, in our children's ministry, and he said, I, I really needed to come to their house immediately. And this is my day off, 
it's Friday morning. I thought, what in the world just happened? Is someone like really sick? Did someone die? I don't know what's going on here. So I get to the house and I notice immediately something happened between them because she's over here with her arms folded and he's over here standing next to me. And he tells me what happened. That morning she, she was looking at a receipt that was on their dresser and she just happened to look at it and said, I see you bought flowers last Thursday. I didn't get any flowers. Who were they for? He says, um, I got them for your mother. Just thinking of her, and so I went and got her some flowers. And she said, oh, okay. I think I'm going to call my mom up and see how she liked her flowers. And he realized, yeah, that's, that's not what happened. So he confessed. He goes, okay, it wasn't for your mother. I bought them for a lady at work. She said, who? And then she began to dig a little bit. Who is this woman? Have you spent any time with this woman? And before long, he couldn't hide it anymore. He came out that he'd been having an affair with a woman at work. You know, you think you can hide sin, but God keeps prodding you. And oftentimes, God will allow it to pop up to the surface when you don't expect it. It's like someone else discovers it before you're ready to share it. it, it I, I, can, I compare it to like taking a volleyball that's fully inflated and you put it underwater like this and you try to hold it and as soon as you take your hand off it, bloop, it comes up. You try to get it back under. It just oh, got caught, got caught because you can't cover up sin forever. But David's going to try. So here's what he does. It says, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And the letter, in the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. This is a plan to have Uriah killed. Really, David, David wants to see him murdered, not at his hands, but the hands of the Ammonites. And what's, what's, what's so amazing about this is David writes this letter, seals it, and who does he give it to to deliver to his commander? He gives it to Uriah. Uriah is actually carrying the piece of paper that describes how he's going to die. Why would David do that? Because David knows the character of this man. He's not going to open it. I know him too well. David, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna execute this man that has better character than you. How shameful is that? What David's doing is multiplying his sins. So Joab does exactly what David says. The war is intense. People back off. Joab is killed. Uh, 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 Uriah is killed. Joab then sends a message back to David, which David knows is coming. But Joab sends a message back to David, tell the king one of his best men had been killed in battle. And they go, David, you're not going to like what, you're, what I'm going to tell you, but Uriah was killed. And David goes, oh my goodness. Well, that's what happens in war. Tell Joab not to be heartbroken over it. It's over. Got it covered. Sealed. But it's like trying to remove a stain, and as you're scrubbing, it just gets messier. What's happening is David is covering up one sin with another sin with another sin with another sin. That's kind of how it works. When you, when you have to cover up sin, you commit other sins in the process. So what started off with just... Um, Lusting and envying another man's wife becomes adultery, leads to lying, leads to murder, leads to dishonoring the name of the Lord. I mean, David commits at least five, it breaks at least five of the Ten Commandments in the process. And he's pulling other people in who have to cover for him. David's making a royal mess of this. And then it says, when the wife of Uriah that's Bathsheba, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She lamented over her husband. I don't even think she knows how it happened. She just knows her husband was killed in battle. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. See, I don't think Bathsheba would have accepted David's invitation to be his wife if she knew that you killed my husband. But she doesn't know. She thinks, how unfortunate my husband got killed. I'm going to be a destitute widow. How kind of David to take me in. And I believe that David probably went, went to bed that night and put his head on the pillow, pillow and, and Bathsheba's by his side, and he goes, it's over. Finally got it all covered up. 
I look like the good guy. I look like the good guy. I'm the compassionate king who took this destitute widow into my home. It's all good. Except he forgets one thing. It says in verse 27, chapter 11, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, David, you forgot. The camera was on you the whole time. God saw every part of it. He knew every thought you made. He, he watched every step you took. In God's eyes, this was a horrendous sin. So much so that in the New Testament, when Matthew's writing the genealogy of Jesus, God never forgets that Uriah was the rightful spouse of Bathsheba. Because listen, this is, the, this is Jesus' genealogy. And Matthew writes this, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Not by, the, not by Bathsheba, his wife, by the wife of the man that David had killed so he could sleep with her. And it's recorded in the genealogy of Jesus. So for generations to come, everyone's going to know this story. She wasn't your husband, or she wasn't, uh, you weren't her husband, David. It was Uriah's. Sin always gets exposed. It may, may be weeks, months, years, maybe a DNA test way down the low road. It may be a it may be an autopsy taken. It, it may not be until you stand judgment before the Lord. But I'll tell you this, it will come out. It will be exposed. I love what Proverbs 10.9 says, whoever, wa whoever walks in integrity walks securely, and he who makes his way crooked will be found out. You want to walk with confidence knowing that, hey, there's no dirt my, uh, behind me, there's no skeletons in my closet, then walk with integrity. But if you're trying to hide something, it's going to come out, okay? God's going to make sure... It comes out. Here's another lie that David's believing. I won't be held accountable for it. It's all past. It's over with. No, it's not. It says, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. I love that part there. Remember how David's sending people? You go do this. You do this. You make this happen. Go get her. Bring her here. Go send this to Job. God says, okay, you want to know who's in charge? Me. And I'm sending someone to you. Because when we try to take control of our lives, God, God has to remind us, you're not in control, I am. And I'm going to fix this broken thing. So God sends Nathan to David. And Nathan tells him a story. Now, he doesn't say this is a parable. David hears it and thinks this actually happened. There were two men in a certain city, and the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, and the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And, and as he brought it up, it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. But there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who'd come to him. So the so he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. I'm trying to think of Nathan, of how hard this must have been to go to David. I mean, Nathan, um, why don't you go preach a sermon? Oh, I love preaching sermons. Yeah, but this is going to be a hard sermon because you're just going to preach it to one person. And it's going to be the king. And it's not going to be pleasant. You know, Nathan has to have a ton of courage to get in David's face and tell this story. But fortunately, God has him do it in a way that it catches David off guard. Because as David hears a story, which he thinks is true, his blood starts to boil. How in the world could this rich man who has so many herds and cattle and all these animals, probably doesn't even know the names of them, would go after this poor man's little ewe lamb, the one that he's raised and nurtured and loved, the only one that he has. He, he knows it by name. It's part of the family. How could he do that? It's indespicable. It's, it's indefensible. He needs to die. Then Nathan says to David, I want those unforgettable lines in Scripture. David, you're that man. It's you, David. That's you. You with all your wives and concubines. Probably don't even remember all their names. Hey, bring me the, bring me the brunette with the, with the mole. Yeah, bring her in. I don't know her name. No. Uriah. Love devoted to Bathsheba. And you took her. 
from him and then killed him. David, you're the man. So listen, David, here's what the Lord says, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. I did all these things for you, David, and if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. David, it's you. God had blessed you with so much. What didn't you have? That you couldn't even, even ask God, God, I, I have another need in my life. Well, of course, Dad, David's not going to come to God. God, um, I want his wife. Of course, that was off limits. Couldn't have that. But if there was anything legitimate that was a need, God says, I would have given it to you, David. But you did this horrible thing. You took matters into your own hand and did some awful things. Do you know when... When we hear a sermon like this, like David, I think we can react much like David did. We can sit in a church service, we can listen to a, a sermon online and go, oh man, my son needs to hear that. My husband wasn't at church. I'm going to tell him to go and watch the service from Sunday because he needs to hear that. And all along God's saying, it wasn't for him, it was for you. The sermon was for you. It was about you. It's not about him. I want to ask you, with today's message, because some of you are saying, like, oh, man, I know some of these here today's message. No, God's message today is for you and for me, that we would deal with the sin in our own lives. See, it's so, I think one of the greatest signs of pride in our lives is how clearly we see the sins in other people and are blind to the sins of our own. We can point out other people and go, oh, yeah, they did this wrong, and they did that wrong. Oh, man, he's horrible, and they did this, and this politician did this. I can see it all. And God says, yeah, those are like specks in your eye. You've got a plank in your own eye, dude. Look in the mirror. It's obvious. It's obvious. But God is gracious. God could have struck David down with lightning, but he didn't. He sent him a preacher. He sent him someone who could open God's word to him so he could repent. It's not there yet. Because David, this is a lie we often believe that this is my issue and mine alone. That's, that my sin affects me and no one else. Sin convinces us that if we indulge in a certain behavior, it's only affecting me. You know, that's why I don't tell my spouse about it. I don't tell other people about it. It's just me. Not, not hurting anybody. What's the big deal? But the truth is, your, your behavior affects a lot of people. It does affect your spouse. It does affect your kids. It does affect your church. It does affect your community. It does affect a lot of other people in ways that you can't even see. Someone who takes their own life often thinks like, well, I'm just going to commit suicide because it's my life. It's not going to affect anybody else. Well, talk to the survivors. Talk to the survivors of what they're dealing with. It's so painful. It's so painful. David destroys Bathsheba's marriage and he sends ripples of consequences through his own family for generations. Here's what Nathan says from the Lord. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son for what you did secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. It's like God's telling David through Nathan, you've come out from under my protective covering, I'm lifting it now. And now all the things that could happen are going to happen. You cause chaos, chaos now will, cause, will, will fall upon your family. But it doesn't end there. Nathan also says, nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. The child actually is born. It's a little boy, cute little boy. They get to play with him. They get to rock him. They get to cradle him. But then he gets sick deathly sick. And David goes into fasting and praying, pleading with God, please, I'm the guilty one. 
Don't, don't hurt this little boy. Don't hurt this baby. But he ends up dying. Why? Because of David's sin. You think that no one else will be affected by your behavior, but it's a lie. Others are, sometimes even worse than you can imagine. And so David finally says, I've sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. I'm sure he wished he could, could have gone back. God, can we just rewind this a few months? And I could, I could start over and not do what I did and can't do it. Can't do it. You have to start right here. And, and, and the way to start to deal with sin is first be honest about it. Come to terms with it. I have done this awful thing. See, we can feel very horrible, especially if you've been walking with the Lord for a period of time and you do something that you know is wrong. I mean, you deliberately did something wrong. You feel so horrible. Like, and you, you start to say, I did the worst thing ever. You ever say that? Like, I just did the worst thing ever. I can't even forgive myself. That's another lie, that it is the worst thing, that whatever sin you committed in your maturity is the worst thing. It's not. Sin is wrong. Sin is bad. Sin is horrible. It's evil. But there's one thing the Bible says is far worse than sin. Guess what it is? Failing to confess it. Because if we fail to confess it, we can never deal with it. God knows we're not perfect. But God wants us to be repentant. See, Paul says in the book of Romans, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It's like, God, I have this, I have this stack of sins over here. He says, that's okay. My stack of grace is this high. But my sins are this high. My grace is this high. I've got more grace than you've got sin. So don't think your sin is beyond my grace. Don't think you've done something that I can't forgive. I can forgive it. That's what amazes me so much when a Christian leader gets confronted and, the, and there, a microphone shoved in their face. Did you really do this thing that people are saying you're doing? No, that's not true. And then you find out, yeah, it was true. Why didn't you just admit it? And they won't. And we won't. We just keep kind of pushing away, blaming others. But David, if you want to see the heart of David, this is where I believe it comes across that David truly is a man after God's own heart. Psalm 51 is his, is his prayer of repentance over this issue with Bathsheba. And we don't have time to read the whole psalm, but you should take time just to do it devotionally this week. I want to read a couple portions of it. Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. Here's what David says to the Lord. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I can't shake it, God. I feel guilty all the time. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. God, you are right. What you said through Nathan was absolutely true, absolutely right. I was totally wrong. I'm the one at fault here. I'm not going to minimize it. I'm not going to justify it. You are justified in what you said. He admits his sin. He admits God is right. And then a few verses later, he asks God this. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David is bold enough to come to God and say, God, would you just remove all this? I admit it. But don't take away what's most precious. I, I want your cleanse, cleansing. I want your joy. I want your Holy Spirit in my life. Please don't take that stuff from me. He pleads with God. God restores it. In fact, here's what Nathan says to David. The Lord has also put away your sin, and you shall not die. God's grace is greater than our sin. It is like a river that flows it's a river that constantly flows. But here's the thing. You can only drink from the river if you get on your knees and bend down. It's for the humble who are willing to acknowledge their sin and get down and take from that river. It's not for the stiff neck, the proud, who says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not stooping down to some, some river. That's not for me. He says, you're going to miss it. But for the humble, the broken, those who come face to face with their sins, God's river of grace flows. In 1 John 1, 7, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can try as hard as you want. You can never cover your sin. You can never cover your tracks. The only thing that will ever cover your sin is the blood of Jesus. And he'll cover all of it if you confess it. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. God's grace starts to change the tone of the story. 
And I actually think there's a beautiful climax to this story, a beautiful kind of ending, a postscript. It says, Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. He's not looking to use her. It's not, it's not his object of pleasure. He feels sadness for her. He goes in to comfort his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her and she bore a son and they called his name Solomon and the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. The gospel is good news. It's not an announcement of God's anger and accusation. It's an invitation to grace. It's good news. That God will deal with our sins, give us full forgiveness, absolute cleansing, full restoration, and abounding joy. You know, sin can promise you pleasure for a moment, but God can give you joy for eternity when we're open and honest before him. So I want to ask you, just very, very directly, which of these lies have you believed? And which of these lies are you believing right now? And where has pride risen up in your own heart to say, that's not me? It's not me, someone else, but not me. I don't have an issue with sin. Because God wants you to come clean. God wants you to see what he sees. And maybe God, instead of a Nathan, has brought a preacher into your life to remind you of that today. That this sermon is for you and for me. I want to close today by, by echoing a prayer of David. David wrote a bunch of psalms, and oftentimes you just really get to see his heart in those psalms and, and what he prayed about. And there's a, there's a closing to Psalm 139 that I think will be very fitting for us today. So we're going to put that on the screen. David writes this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you pray that prayer today? Would you be like David and say, God, this is me and you today. And this is my prayer. I want to pray. I want to have a heart after you like David. So here's what I'm asking God, search me. Search me. What do you see? Maybe you need to listen a little bit to hear what the Lord sees. Maybe God's going to whisper to you, yeah, I see how you treat your spouse. I see how you treat your kids or how you treat your parents. I see your posts. I read your texts. Are you willing to like put everything out there and say, God, search me? Is there anything I'm doing that's displeasing to you? Show me. Try me. That means test me, Lord. Test me. Know my thoughts. Go into my head. I don't like, I don't like what's happening there. I want to be pleasing to you. So we're just going to give you a couple minutes just to sit in the presence of the Lord while Nick plays. And just allow God to speak to you and make that your prayer. Maybe add your own words to it. But let's make this a time of, of getting our hearts right with the Lord and not believing the lies about sin, but the truth about Jesus and God's word. All right? Take a couple minutes and I'll be back to close. You go ahead and stand. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come on up here. If you need prayer today, maybe God's unearthed something in your life that you need to talk to someone, pray with someone about. Our prayer partners will be up here in front. You can come up just as soon as I 
finish with this closing prayer. You know what? When I was studying for this message, what struck me the most and looking at the, the news reports of people, even here locally, there have been in recent news, another pastor in a church. And it, and it just, it's kind of scary to think those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a long time sometimes do the most foolish things. You're not immune from Satan's trickery. I'm not either. Don't let pride rise up in you. Be humble. Be humble before the Lord. So Jesus, thank you that there's enough grace to cover every one of my sins. And thank you that you died on the cross knowing how fallen we, we are. But Lord, you require not perfection, but honesty. You require us to come before you with total surrender, opening the books before you, not trying to cover up, not trying to make excuses, not trying to blame others, but taking ownership. And I pray that today would be a day of freedom for many in this place, that maybe for the first time in years, maybe the first time in weeks, first time in a long time, they've taken ownership of their sins, laid it all before you so that grace can flow freely. I thank you that it does. In Jesus' name, amen.